Thank you for listening to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. Sign up to our Patreon to receive bonus content, live streams and our weekly newsletter with money off books and museum visits as well. Plus early access to all live show tickets. That's patreon.com slash we have ways. Alarm, alarm! Welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk, now into our eighth century of podcasting. <laughs> the Second World War podcast, of course, with me, Al Murray, and James Holland. James, where are you? Uh, I am in Port Lowe on the Roseland Peninsula in, down in Cornwall. This was booked absolutely ages and ages and ages ago, and I was imagining that I'd be deep into Casino 44 by now and would desperately need it. Uh, in fact, I'm using it to finish off this novel that I've been writing on and off oh. for uh, ages, and uh, I've just got to get it done. Yeah. The thing is, is you can be down. You can come down here. and You can just be completely selfish. You can just do completely your own thing. I haven't got to take Daisy to the bus. I haven't got to empty dishwashers. I haven't got to do anything. I can just so I get into a very very strict regime of getting up at six at my desk by six twenty. Yeah. Uh, work till about eight eight thirty. Have a little bit of yeah. breakfast. Crack on. Go for a walk. Crack on. Crack on. Crack on. Lovely. Stop. You know. Turn in about nine. Go to bed. Watch Al Murray do he why. Everyone hates the British Empire. Go to sleep. <laughs> Repeat. Sounds like an essential routine for everyone. I mean, I've already written 2,000 words this morning. All right. Very good. Excellent. So, you know. Excellent. Pounding it out. And what, what, is this a Jack Tanner? No, it's not actually. This is a, a sort of family saga I'm writing. It's, sort of, it's called Alveston. It's sort of set on a fictional farm, but it's multi generational. So you've got the kind of, the, you know, the aging patriarchs in their 70s, and you've got their kids, three sons who are all in their kind of late 40s. Uh, mid to late 40s and then you've got their children and their children and farm workers and stuff are all going off to war so right now i'm on the on the eep commune canal on the night of the 27th of may 1940 gosh and uh they're doing an attack and oh. you know it's dunkirk we've got you know one of the sons is in the in the raf one of the kind of sub characters is a you know midshipman on a on a destroyer etc cetera, etc cetera. you know covering all bases yeah oh, very good and then you go back to the farm you know, so it's always sort of rooting it back to the kind of, you know, the homestead. But it's quite, it's quite fun to, talking, you know, writing about and recreating that drama of 1940 and what, what people know. And I think rather cunningly, one of the, one of the daughters is uh, one of the private secretaries of General Hastings Ismay. Right. Ah, oh, very good. So that gets you the kind of high level stuff. Ah, oh, very good. That's clever. So she knows what's going on. So she knows it's going to go on, but, but has to shoulder that burden herself because she can't tell anyone. And one of the sons' his wife is German from Bavaria. Ah, oh, very good. Because after the First World War, he's, they've got a family brewery, and so he's gone over to learn techniques. Right. And met her, married her, brought her back. So oh, she's right. lived 20 years in the village in, you know, in, in rural Wiltshire. Well, and is she... But she's about to be interned. All right, I've just... <laughs> because her, her brother and her father are members of the Nazi party and they've oh, written no. to her. So she's classified category B rather than a C. Oh, no. You know, arguably completely unfairly. Yeah. But it means that she's going to have a month in Holloway. Oh, God. Wow. She's not going to become radicalised in the process. No, no, no. <laughs> No, good. No, 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 it's all going to be fine. <laughs> um, so that's what you're in Cornwall. And how long are you there for? Fortnight? Uh, just two weeks. Well, until I get it done. If I finish it earlier, I'll go home earlier. Right. Brilliant. Excellent. But I've got this little cottage. It's just me and Betsy. Lovely. It's a bit lonely, but, you know, it's fine. I'm seeing you. Needs must, Jim. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just got to do it. Just got to do it. Or else I don't get paid. Then I don't get on to casino. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But I did a little talk in um, Bridport yesterday, and a number of members of the Dorset IC, which is nice to see. Ah, oh, very good. The Dorset show. Chris and Excellent. Nick and, and the gang. So it was Brilliant. great seeing them. Oh, that's so, very nice. Uh, so that Excellent. was all right. And um, fully recovered from SBS paddling. So that's all all right. Yeah, and yeah. You would have finished by now anyway, right? We would have finished, yeah. It was only going to be three days, but we yeah. <laughs> only got one. <laughs> <laughs> I was sort of halfway between kind of feeling really, really hacked off that we, we couldn't finish it and at the same time feeling really relieved. <laughs> <laughs> A, because it was quite hard work, and B, because it was quite hairy, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> sort of, I mean, the white white tops of the waves sort of, you know, yeah. crushing over the uh, over the bow of our pepper boat. <laughs> Christ. Slightly wobbling about on this big sea, kind of, you oh, know, no gusting, gusting six. No, thank you. <laughs> anyway.
<laughs> well, I mean, it, I mean, it shows how um, iron hard those men must have been, right? Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. And you could it, it certainly gave you a, a bit of a flavour for Frankton, and particularly that mouth of the River Gironde, because you know it's it's the meeting of river flows against tide with wind that is the that's your sort of killer trio combination. So you could completely understand why why two of them got into immediate trouble, and one of them completely capsized, and that was that. So yeah, absolutely. But also, I watched your um, the first of your programs last night. Oh, thank you. Oh, good. Uh, the India one, which I enjoyed very much. Yeah. It's entertaining. I isn't certainly it? look like you're having a good time. Yeah, we're having a great time. And I mean, <laughs> some of the history is sort of boggling, really. You know, what the East India Company got away with and and how they went about it is all a bit completely hair raising, to be honest. Yeah, scurrilous. Yeah, and capital just driving everything i mean put put aside all the other i mean this is the, the way i came to thinking about the british empire in the end is that the, the sort of I mean, it's going to get quite heavy quite quickly but the sort of racism and all that that follows i think follows springs from capital in action i don't think they're going there with those ideas on board necessarily no. they're going there to make money and then the making money becomes so entrenched that those other ideas then come into play yeah, because there isn't any particular racism. I mean, the, the sort of super, the sense of superiority, but there isn't particular yeah. racism. Well, well in the way that, you know, with its sort of 19th century clothing, the way we understand it, I think. Yeah, there's a sense that might is right, and there's a sense that um, money money talks. And, and then the, all of the rest follows. But I just sort of, you know, in India, Clive's sort of corporate takeover decapitation of, of you know, the, the status quo in Calcutta is, in Bengal is absolutely fascinating. And, you know, rampant capital is the thing with, with all those other things in its service. But, you know, the, the end is capital and everything else is a means to it, which I think is the, the thing I came away from, which sounds, makes me sound like an unreconstructed Marxist, but there you go. What, what no, that's you right. Do? <laughs> so, right i thought darjeeling looked nice i've never been up there oh my god amazing and the gorkali um because the, they're they're gorka people there they're, they're india's gurkhas they call themselves and there's been a sort of um self-rule thing going on there for a while and they've asserted themselves as you know that they're indian but they're gorka just the idea is that they don't have a divided loyalty they're not nepalese they're not and, and there's an amazing monument there of this sort of 30 foot tall gurkha with his head bowed down over his SLR, and then all the battles they fought for the Indian army. Really, really amazing. And the little train pulls up and stops there before it does another sort of couple of weird circuits to get further up the hill. But when you kind of, when you sort of just amazed by the scale of it and the, and the enormity of what actually happened during those years, from an engineering technical point of view, oh, I, mean, I, know, I know I know your co-host was going, I know Al, all you're going to talk about is the trains and all the rest of it, but it's kind of hard <laughs> not to think about the trains. Well, the, well, the engineering, the scale of the engineering, and, and funnily enough, this ties into um, my visit to the uh, Sappers Museum, Royal Engineers Museum at Chatter the other week, because they make the point that, you know, that it's the Royal Engineers who are very much completely tied up in all that sort of imperial infrastructure. Mm. Because after all, it's about, I mean, we talked in the programme about it's about getting your goods and services in and out of the country as rapidly as possible. But it's also about being able to deliver deliver military force in the event of things not going your way as the imperial power. And the Royal Engineers, that you know, the fact that you have engineers leading military expeditions into Africa and stuff tells you everything you need to know about the centrality of engineering and therefore military engineering to the, to the imperial project. In as much as it's a project, because that's the other thing. It's the other thing that like really came away from the program is it's totally haphazard. No one knows what they're doing. There is no plan. Because no. if there were if there were a plan, you wouldn't have had a thing like the, the, the cock up with the cartridges, you know, Indian Mutiny, first first war of independence or whatever you call it now. I mean, that wouldn't have happened if there'd been a plan, but there there wasn't a plan. There were all these different people jostling for position and influence and and also because capital's driving it, they're all trying to save money all the time because they want but to But it is money. also amazing that the East India Company is allowed to operate in the way that it does as an independent private company. I mean, I know I know, right up to the 1930s, you've got British British business interests still kind of owning most of the Argentine, for example. But but, but even so, the, the fact that they're sort of wearing scarlet and kind of, you know, <laughs> organising entire armies is just extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, and sort of has this built-in deniability or something about it for the British ruling classes it's so bizarre and also it also allows the british state to opt out when it wants india to be nothing to do with it it allows it that opportunity so when they can go it's nothing to do with us gov if they want because that's the way it's set up and i think that's really really interesting and also it speaks to the sort of centrality of money in the whole thing why get in the way of that when if money's being made why why interfere and the money people won't like it if you interfere as well if you come in as a state actor but it's fascinating but 
We've been trading documents, haven't we? You see, you sent me this amazing tome, and it's, I don't know if the one I sent you has come through yet. Yes, it has. Yes, it has. It has. Great. So, Fibua, um, fighting in, in built-up areas. And this is the 1943 military training pamphlet number 55, reprinted with amendments number one, 1945. Yeah, 1945. So it's the 1943 updated. Don't you just love these things? I just I absolutely love well, these I, things. God, I, did I tell you that I went to the um, the keep, the museum in Bodmin? For the oh. DCLI, et cetera, uh, the, the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry. And in their archive there, they've just got literally every single one of these training pamphlets and, oh. you know, all that kind of stuff. I've, I mean, I've got a good stash of them at home. Well, I went on a little splurge and I've got, so I've got the 1945 Airborne Ops Summary, which is which is quite interesting. I've got um, First Allied Airborne Army's establishment document, What We Are. And I've got the 1944 Infantry Training Manual. Because what, I want to, what I'm trying to look at with the Arnhem book, because the critical thing that happens in Arnhem is they end up fighting in a built-up area. When, as one of the South Stafford's officers says, we've been training on Salisbury Plain and doing battalion advances on a 500-yard 500, 500 front, you know, with, the, with two companies up front, one in reserve. Or in the case of the air landing bat- battalions, you know, three companies up, one in reserve, because they've got four companies. And as you'll recall from being watching that artillery display on Salisbury Plain, there's not a lot else going on no. on Salisbury Plain other than Salisbury Plain. No. There's no villages, there's no towns, there's nothing. It's just like the big central part of Wiltshire is the plain. Yeah, you aren't even learning how to fight with villages or strongholds. You're doing it in the you know classical two companies up, one in reserve sort of thing. But as they go into Arnhem, and having been there, we've st- we've stood at the, you know, in the book I'm calling it the bottleneck with a capital B, which is the, the point at which... The high road that the Utrechtsweg and the and the Hulkensweg, whatever it's called, it can never get these Dutch names quite right, come up, meet, and then split again, bifurcate again. Where one goes down, the bottle of that's a great word, isn't it? Bifurcate. It is a beautiful word. Yeah. Um, it goes one road goes down to the right along the bottom of the river bank. Then there's a very steep embankment with this, which is sort of scooped out by an ice cream spoon, as it were, for about half a mile, maybe a little longer. And then the road along the top, which has the hospital and houses, and then the museum or monastery, as the South Staff's called it, at the top. And the, the problem is, is you can't go beyond that because you've got the railway line and you've got... Yeah, the geography The geography perfectly dominates. And I think one of the one of the things I'm sort of coming away wondering is how hard people have looked at the maps when they actually drew their routes. Well, certainly up. the contours, I suppose. That's the point. It's the contours, how hard they'd looked at that. Oh, it's Holland, it's flat. Well, exactly. I mean, how many people have gone have been to Arnhem beforehand? No, nobody, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's not like send us all your postcards from northern France in, in a year building up to Overlord, is it? No, they don't, ha- they don't have any of that. And, you know, we touched on this a while ago that reconnaissance is really important. But fighting in a built... this. So I got the fighting in a built-up area manual, right? Because one of the things that really struck me about the fighting in Arnhem, having read The Savage Storm by historian James Holland in, in, all, in all good bookshops <laughs> and on Kindle now is that basically the fighting in Ort- in Ortona is kind of the reverse negative image of the fighting in Arnhem. Paratroopers, lightly armed, holding incredibly stiffly house to house against people with artillery, tanks, and lots of infantry who are able to then grind you down and overwhelm you, right? Yeah, and it's- the amazing thing is the German paratroopers lose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. There's a lesson yeah. there. There's, or there's something. There's at least a solid echo. But this manual is fascinating. So one of the things I love about the publications from this era, right, is the way they do that kind of like... Their generous use of, of both Roman and ordinary numerals. Well, there's, there's that. <laughs> and quite clearly, someone who can write has written this. But there's a... So um, on the, uh, in chapter one, in the introduction, yeah. so there's the introduction, then there's two, some aspects of fighting in built-up areas, right? And it does the thing these manuals always do, where they go, there's nothing to worry about here, chaps. You know. Yes, the principles of town fighting differ in no way from those which govern more open warfare. There are, however, special circumstances attached <laughs> exactly. to town fighting which have a direct bearing on the tactics employed. All right, here we go. <laughs> exactly. But it's just classic, isn't it? It's exactly the same, apart from all these complete differences. <laughs> um, so, so, and I was really struck by that. <laughs> yes, and the next line is brilliant. Yeah, I know, I know. No Five. other battlefield includes ground both so open and so close. So, in other words... <laughs> It's not at all similar. <laughs> no, exactly. Right. Not, not remotely. But imagine you're you're a, you're a subaltern. You've been you know you've been told you've got to you've got to read this. You've got to know about it by the morning. In so in, it goes on in every street, a coverless stretches affording ideal fields of fire. 
bordering every street, and numerous protected firing positions, hiding places and sources of ambush. It follows that fighting will nearly always be at close quarters, casualties high, and the nerve strain for both sides heavy. Oh, well, at least get that out of the way then. (laughs) I know, exactly. (laughs) But then it's absolutely fascinating. Is there any sense that they've learned the lessons from Altona? Well. On mouse holding. (laughs) Well, read read your next paragraph. When a built-up area is the scene of a prolonged period of fighting, however, many of its characteristics will be modified. (laughs) Even more different from open warfare. No shit! Buildings are liable to become heaps of rubble and fields of view therefore thereby increased. When a whole sector of a town is reduced to rubble, the piles of debris render the area an, an analogous to close country, providing much cover. They will also restrict movement except on foot. The possible change in the character of a built-up area must be borne in mind when reading this pamphlet, which deals with a built-up area in which most of the buildings are still standing. Okay, so so we'll ignore this for the Battle of Cleve then. Yeah, which or Col- we've sent over our... <laughs> oh, God. I'll tell you what, it does It does already, I mean, I know we're talking about Arnhem, but it does already make me think, what on earth were they doing, doing that heavy bombing on these towns? Well, or they've decided that the, the rubble's actually easier because they're, it's more like fighting in open country, and open country's the thing we've been training for. I, I, I was really struck by this. Yes, I wonder whether that's it. This says, oh, okay, so that's why you bomb somewhere flat, because it straightens the line between what you know you can do and what you've got to do. But that's not why Israel is bombing Gaza City, is it? It's bombing that to try and hit specific Hamas targets. Specific targets, as far as we know. I mean, can't say anything confident about anything there. But then what you've got is, if you go to point nine, difficulty of control. Basically, what I'm trying to do is, is in the book, there's 11th Parachute Battalion. You tend to get kind of written out of the story a little. More or less ignored, because they, they're one day in the battle and then they're, and they're basically destroyed. I'm trying to use the manual to explain what happens to them in this regard. So difficulty of control. Buildings cause exceptionally blind and disjointed conditions, right? This is what that Captain Mawson describes. This is why you blow it up. Well, yeah, but also, but this is why controlling your guys is difficult. Disjointed conditions. If you've got if you've got the infantry section who've gone into number 14, Utrecht's Feg. Yeah, 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 where's 14 section? Well, I don't know, sir. They went into that building over there. Well, do you know where they are now? Uh, no. Which building over there? The one on the left, the one in the middle, the one on the right? The one with the blue door. The one with the blue door, exactly. Which blue? You know, you, you can you meet... And, and a company, a rifle company, Parachute Regiment Rifle Company at this point, is only 90 bayonets. So not very many people. So, so if you break that down into sections... Well, the sections are quite small. They're less than 10, are they? They're 10-man sections with two okay, brain guns. So that, that's standard. That's standard. But you wouldn't have all the support stuff. But you haven't got, you haven't got everything quite as you want it yet. So, well, so let's say 10 men go into a house. Yeah. So that's one section gone. And you don't know, are they in the house with the blue door or the red door? And then another section go into a house with the green door. And then another, you know, dug into that garden. That's a whole platoon soaked up immediately. And none of them can talk to each other because they're not in open country where they can shout. <laughs> They've got a fucking great brick wall between them. They've gone, right? They've vanished. So your control of them is just completely gone, hasn't it? And your radio doesn't work because you're in a building. It's a bit like being underground with a mobile phone. You, you've got company walkie-talkies, but they don't work. They're new and they don't work. Because no, because comms don't work in the Second World War. It's, it's a rule. And, and it's quite interesting because... There's, there's a couple of accounts that say, oh, you know, the radios keep being blamed for Arnhem, but it, was, it wasn't any better or worse than anywhere else in the Second World War. It's like, it's a normal comm situation. It's the fact that the battle's running out of control. And the well, do you don't... remember in, in Italy, the Germans have terrible trouble because all yeah. the signals, the radios don't work at night for some reason. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly, exactly. Anyway, so buildings cause exceptional blind and disjointed conditions. So first of all, you're disjointed. In no other form of warfare, except in dense forest and bush, are there such narrow and limited horizons or such physical barriers between units of the same force. And that's the key part, Yeah, of yeah, the same yeah. force. Highly centralised control will be difficult. Most of the fighting will resolve itself into small, independent actions, and much will depend upon individual initiative and capabilities. So great, you've got, so one of the things is you do have soldiers here who are trained to be very, very yeah. aggressive and act on their initiative, right? Uh, distances will be short and therefore will allow commanders to exert a more decisive influence in the battle area because personal appearances well forward in their areas can be made more easily and more quickly than in other forms of fighting, right? So he's saying, this manual's saying, Lieutenant Colonels, Battalion and company commanders, you are going to have to he- rush about figuring out where your guys are. Once you've found them, figure out where they are in relation to the- everyone else and then get them to all act together. It's really difficult, right? And bearing in mind that the ground, as it says, 
involves big, wide open sectors, which are ideal fields of fire. Moving around is going to be really, 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 really difficult. Yet this kind of fighting depends on you moving around in order to exert control of the battalion level, say, or company. Yeah. So those two paragraphs say to me, this is why if you go into an area where the two roads narrow down to one point and then split again, and there's a slice where there's no cover at all, because let's say the, let's say your colonel goes forward all the way along the bottom of the embankment, along the underlangs, gets to where the, as far as one and three para get, and he's dug in there, and then he says, chaps, we need to go back to the pavilion. He's got to, he's got to be going backwards and forwards. Yeah, like a yo-yo. Like a yo-yo. And, and, and of course, the building, the fact that the buildings are there means you're completely canalised. Yeah. Because you're having to use the roads because you can't just walk through a building. Yeah, yeah. You you got you you know you can scurry through a through a field or along a hedge line, but you can't do that in in urban warfare. Yeah, exactly. And they use an awful lot of smoke on that area of scrub on the embankment to get forward and go forward. But essentially, the smoke is announcing to the Germans that they're, that they're putting in an attack and they're, that they're there. And it's an open space, and it's obvious where they're going. And do we know whether they've done any urban training at all? Well, this is the thing I'm trying to trying to sort of wriggle into and try and find because I don't. Two of the things I'm trying to I'm trying to find in the accounts more people saying, well, you know, we were used to exercising in Salisbury Plain, so we hadn't really prepared for any of this, right? What about looking at the various battalion war diaries before Arnhem? Well, I've been doing that, and the the eleven para stuff. It's all Salisbury Plain and villages and everything, and and the and the stuff they the the one divisional exercise that they do because the other thing about eleven para is eleven para is training on its own in. Um, Tel Aviv or somewhere like that, right? Barat David, it's training training by itself in Palestine. The rest of the brigade is posted to, to Tunisia. And then the rest of the 4th Power Brigade, they go in slapstick, they go into Taranto, right? The 11 Power are left out of that. And then are summoned to England at the over Christmas of 43, 44. And then have to be integrated into the brigade because they've never been part of the brigade. So their training is, has been on a different stream this entire time. They do like... Parachute exercises around the Sea of Galilee and stuff is really like, and in Gaza of all places they do a parachute wow. exercise in Gaza. So they're they're from another planet, right? Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, yeah. And they're just not, they're not their training for Northwest Europe is pretty limited. Yeah, it starts in January 1944, basically. Okay, so that's finally... seven months or whatever. Nine yeah, months. and they get integrated. Then there's a bit, there's an issue with a mutiny and all this all this sort of drama around them. And the one divisional exercise that that first airborne do is as six airborne's air enemy in preparation for D Day. They do a thing where they're standing in as the enemy for, for, for you know, a Normandy rehearsal in a thing called Operation Mush, Exercise Mush, rather. Yes, yes, um, yes. But, but basically, what they haven't trained for, and what's interesting, at the back of this manual, there's loads of maps. So there's a, there's a series of maps and aerial photographs. I'm still looking at uh, the, the other points. Points 11. <laughs> Buildings obscure view. And visibility yep. during actual fighting is apt further to be restricted on account of brick dust caused by the strike of projectiles and by explosive charges. Owing to the presence of buildings, smoke tends to remain concentrated for longer periods than is normal because you've got no wind pushing it away. So everyone's just going around hacking their guts up, not seeing anything. And, you know, buildings will be on fire as well. I mean, it, as well as weapon smoke and brick Reconnaissance dust. will not be effective by observation alone, and information will have to be gained by fighting to induce the enemy to disclose his weapons and general dispositions, i.e. so you've got to get, you really got to get up close and personal because you've got to capture lots of people. And then... We come back to... Yeah, movement is easily seen. Yes, 12, conspicuousness of movement. Because the major part of cover is rigid and set out in straight lines, movement is easily seen. Basically, someone's going to come around a corner in a minute. So keep a, you know, keep a machine gun on that corner. Oh my God, look at this. Point 13, difficult of locating fire. Difficulty of locating fire. The point of origin of fire is difficult to locate on account of the noise of discharge being drowned by the crack of a bullet as it passes by passes or by the noise of impact of a projectile and because of the bewildering number of points from which fire can be brought to bear in a relatively small area. It's also difficult to recognise and distinguish between the noise of strike and the noise of discharge. Consequently, false rumours and information are apt to arise concerning such points as the presence of enemy snipers. What may sound like enemy firing from adjacent rooms or buildings may mean, in reality, that the latter are being subjected to fire from elsewhere. And the thing is, there is an instant where they think one power are firing on three power in, right. the, in the Lombok estate. But no one knows. No. Well, this is, I mean, 16 is a reassuring point. <laughs> <laughs> the enemy's fire can be stopped by ours in two main ways, either by getting in the first shot or by getting in more shots and from more directions than the enemy can. Oh, well, that's all right then. 
<laughs> the first is preferable and saves valuable lives, but to obtain it, observation by every man in an organized system must be taught. So basically what you're saying is get into that house and everyone just fire and cause an absolute racket, which will then confuse everybody even more, but at least you'll have one over the enemy. Yeah. But you won't know what the hell's going on. Observation by every man in an organized system must be taught. But the manual has already made clear several times that organizing is really, really difficult because the conditions make, whatever that expression was, difficulty control, disjointed conditions. Because for you, not leave the enemy out of it. It's difficult for you to know what you're doing, let alone what he's doing. I mean, then there's a, there's a brief paragraph on looting. <laughs> then there's a major paragraph on civilians. We yeah. haven't even got to them yet. But they're quite low on the list, though, aren't they? They're po- point twenty two is civilians. Yeah. I mean, what I mean, it's very interesting. Is the the, the, the one before that in point, importance of height? The possession of height gives a feeling of security over an enemy who's on a lower level, but is often counterbalanced by the effect of hostile air bombing. So basically, they're talking about how it's a sort of three dimensional space as well. Yeah. When I read this, the thing I came away with is I could see why they bombed Caen because you know we've been racking our brains about that. Why would you do that? Why would you you know in Cleaver? Why 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 are you doing this? You know it doesn't work. You know it's difficult. But would fighting through Caen street by street in the manner described in here have been even more difficult and even more manpower consuming? Because steel, not flesh, what you've got here is an awful lot of flesh and not a lot of steel. Yeah, exactly. Yes, well, this is what he, he, he says this. The summary, fighting in built-up areas reduces the advantages enjoyed in open warfare by the side that is superior mobile equipment and vehicles. It involves chiefly infantry action in the form of small, numerous, and independent battles, and its dominant feature is an abundance of cover interspersed with short, open fields of fire. Such fighting, therefore, favours the defence, except possibly at night. In addition, it requires increased yes. manpower for a given area. Now, that is the absolute kicker in the in First Airborne's problem. They don't have increased manpower. Well, yeah. Because their battalions are small, right? And not made on the same basis as the Fallschirmjäger, the German no. paratroopers. Well, which is what we're going to talk about next. So we'll take a quick... I mean, the, the stuff about the weapons is really... Because obviously what you need is... Auto- well, let's go back to that and then we can go on to Falchion Yeah, yeah, okay. Let's have a break. We'll do for weapons and then we'll... Yeah, yeah, okay. We'll see you in a bit. Welcome back to We Have Ways to Make You Talk, where James and I are staring open mouth at the... Fibua. The Fibua. I'll tell you what, this is absolutely fascinating, isn't it? Isn't it? But this is what I'm trying to do with this chapter is, it, is it, you know, I, you can tell the story of what happened, but you can go, right, well, here are the, here are the actual challenges as recognised by the army, by the chiefs of staff. Here are the challenges. So what's really interesting? So, what, you know. <laughs> I was the machine yeah. carbine. Yeah. So but that mean, they mean a Tommy gun, right? Or a Sten. Or a Sten gun. Yeah, this is, this is great. The machine <laughs> yeah. carbine is an ideal weapon for hand-to-hand fighting and affords the, ma- the main reserve of firepower literally in the hands of each section commander. It has, however, small powers of penetration and contrary to general belief, is ineffective against bolts and locks of doors. <laughs> now, you need a Colt 45 for that. Well... But doesn't a Thompson take a 45? Yeah. You've mainly got Thompsons in Italy, haven't you? And in Northwest Europe, you've mainly got... Stands, Stand. you? That tends to be the way it breaks down, roughly, isn't it? I think. Uh, no, I mean, it starts off with the rifle. Now, of course, the rifle, the smelly, right? That's ideal for the kind of open warfare on Salisbury Plain where, you know, your, your infantry sections are moving up in, you know. Advancing 400, far from 400 yards. Exactly, right? Obviously, the manual does this um, again. It does that thing of going, this is perfectly useful. This is exa- absolutely fine. No, it's not, right? So the rifle in practiced hands is an immensely valuable and reliable weapon. At the necessarily short ranges, inaccurate fire should never occur. The rifle is sometimes described as cumbersome in streets and houses, but never by men who are used to its manipulation and carrying it. I mean, yeah, yeah. So in other words, you might be complaining about it, but don't. Yeah, because that's what we've given you. That's what we've given you, and it's brilliant. I'm not hearing anything against it. When um, the men from the town, when they leave the town in the afternoon of, the, of Tuesday the 19th, and it's th- th- that ragtag of people who end up bottom of the perimeter and end up eventually at the church, but they're, fi- they're fighting in that stretch beyond the railway bridge for, the, for like a day or so. They haven't got any rifles because they've ditched them all and they've all got stens. And Sheriff Thompson, who's the uh, light battery commander, or the light regiment commander, he basically says, we're on the defensive now, you're going to need rifles. So they have to find rifles because the men, the men all know that the rifles are no use 
in the fighting in the town. But he knows that in defence they're much better off with rifles because you can you can fend people off from right. a greater distance. I mean, it really really interesting. And they've literally ditched their they've literally thrown their rifles away because they, they don't think they're any good. Wow. Um, yeah, and then he says effective sniping. He says effective sniping in an enclosed area can by itself bewilder and almost paralyze the efforts of the other side. So basically, it's saying. Our number one weapon, the rifle, that's our staple rifle in the British Army, is not much use in this situation. Which, I mean, it's not good, is it, when you're reading no. this? No. And also, you can see why you end up with assault rifles. How much do you think they've changed it in, in the 1945 number one edition? I don't know. That's a good question. That's a really good question. And I wonder how, I wonder how different it is to what you'd read now, what the British Army would issue now. I'm sure some of our listeners would be able to tell us. And then it talks about LMGs. And no point with a boys' anti tank rifle, two inch mortar, three inch mortar. I think, you know, I think it's really, really interesting. And also, the stuff about anti tank guns is, you know, 0.40 further down is really interesting. That the problem is that you can use it against snipers and stuff, but, yeah. but the tanks, the tanks are going to be coming around the corner. So the crews are going to, I mean, it's anyway, I thought it'd be worth a look. But then you sent me the handbook on German military. This is Amer- an American handbook. Yeah, well, I've got, I've got, I've got, I mean, I've got absolutely hundreds of these. Um, these they have technical manuals and they have field manuals, so they have FM, TM, and then a kind of little code. And this is this is TME technical manual E thirty four five one, right? And it's huge. And they did a nineteen forty three edition, which is quite small, which I sent you last night. Um, yeah. Uh, but the forty five edition is just immense. And um, as I was telling you beforehand, I've got this, I've got this really old copy which I bought second hand and. Obviously, the person who owned it before was a heavy smoker because it still smells of stale tobacco. It's an absolute piece of work. But it's incredibly – it's just brilliant because it's got the breakdown of everything that – you know, all the equipment they use, the structure, yeah. organization, yeah. training, everything. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there, there is literally nothing it doesn't have. And what it does have is quite interesting because you were talking about, you know, a, um, a parachute, a British um, parachute battalion being only about 550 men strong rather than eight, four, five. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is what you'd normally have. Eleven power go in with five hundred and seventy-one men. All right. Okay. So as a, so so you know three hundred less than an ordinary infantry battalion. Yeah. What's really interesting about the Fauschenjäger regiment <laughs> and battalion is that they are much bigger. So a parachute rifle regiment, which is the equivalent to a brigade with three battalions, has three thousand two hundred and six men. Yeah. So. Including to that, you know, your staff and auxiliary. You know, each battalion has got to be nine hundred plus. Nine hundred. Yes, they're, they're, those are those are big, big battalions, aren't they? But but check out this. Okay, but then okay. So we we know that they are lightly armed. That you know they're small arm heavy. But look what they've got. Okay, this is obviously this is not always the case because we know that very rarely are these units operating at, at, at full capacity. But at full capacity, this is what they're expected to have. So number of rifles, 1,651 per regiment, per three battalions. 968 pistols, 751 submachine guns, MP40s, whatever. 224 light machine guns, 24 heavy machine guns, 39 81mm mortars, 9 120 millimeter mortars and 54 Panzerfaust, right? Or Panzer Shrek? Or Shrek? I mean, that is a lot. So, for for the 3,206 men in each regiment, yeah, you've got including rifles, submachine guns, LMGs, and heavy machine guns. You've got 3,394. So you've got more than one per person. Yeah, I mean that's something else, isn't it? Yes, that's a lot of firepower. Well, I mean, if, if the battalions are like 900 strong, then you're looking at a 900 strong battalion, three battalions. You're, you're kind of looking at one an LMG for every 10 men, aren't you, roughly? Well, they, the, the rule is that you have two per section. So let's, let's work that out. So if you've got 3,206 divided by three, let's call it kind of, you know, 1,000 men per battalion or, or certainly yeah. 950. Yeah. Yeah, that does make about right. That's right, right, isn't it? But you've got a lot of, I mean... You still, you've still got more than one small arm per person. Yeah, the page before has the actual breakdown. So you've you've machine gun companies, mortar companies in a regiment. You've a parachute regiment. You've regimental HQ, regimental HQ company. I mean, it's, the, the detail on this book, in this book is amazing. 
But but I've got to say, this is a lot heavier than I thought. When you've got the second battalion of the third Fallschirmjäger regiment in Ortona, and it's down to sixty men. God. Yeah. Then they've been gone through properly. Yeah. They've been gone through properly. Yeah. It's just amazing, isn't it? I mean, it's a hell of a lot of small arms. It is, and mortars too. Because more mortars, more the more and more I read, mortars are central to absolutely everything, aren't they? But look at the parachute artillery regiment: fifteen hundred and seventy-one people, one thousand two hundred fifty rifles, two hundred eighteen pistols, one hundred sixty-eight submachine guns, fifty-three light machine guns. Even on that, you know, they're, they're fine guns. They've still got machine guns. I mean, the thing is, though, this is never delivered by air, is it? No. Well, this is what's really interesting. So, because those that artillery regiment has twenty-four hundred five millimeter howitzers, doesn't it? And twelve hundred fifty millimeter howitzers. That they're, they're not they're not inserting those by air, are they? I mean, I don't know. No. That's well, listen to this. Um, it says. If the SS Armoured Division is considered the strongest type of division in the German Armed Forces, the German Air Force Parachute Division is believed to be the strongest type of the various infantry divisions. Yeah. While in the course of this war, small German parachute units have been employed successfully as airborne troops in various campaigns, in the West, in the Balkans, in Crete and Sicily, one generally may consider the present Air Force Parachute Divisions as especially carefully selected, well-trained and equipped crack infantry divisions with only a small percentage of their personnel having received training as parachutists in the American sense of the word. The significant organisational difference between the Parachute Division and the Army Infantry Division is that each of the three Parachute Rifle Regiments has three battalions and a larger allotment of machine guns than the corresponding Army units. That's interesting. Parachute Artillery Regiment has only three battalions, one light, one, two light, one medium. But yeah. the division includes a parachute anti-aircraft battalion and a parachute 120 millimeter mortar battalion. But what that's telling you is, is that these are kind of not far off double the size of the yeah. British model. Yeah. Which is yeah. ironic because in squadrons, fighter squadrons, British and American fighter squadrons are double the size of a German fighter squadron. Yeah. <laughs> that's just the way the establishment's worked out. I mean, the, the thing is, is that, you know, in 1st Airborne Division, there are an awful lot of supporting arms people. So you've got, you've got absolutely everything else as well. You know, you've, you, yes. you've got a, a lot of anti-tank. You've got the light regiment bringing, it's a small gun, but they've, they bring a lot of them, of the pack howitzers, the 75 mil pack howitzers, you know, and the, there's no glider pilots on here in the way there are, although, you know, the big idea with them is, they're relieved and sent home, actually. They, they don't have to fight. It's just that's the way things turn out in, in Holland. It's fascinating. And then there's a cavalry division. You've got point six is the parachute division, point seven an Air Force Field Division. Then point eight cavalry division. Cavalry yep. de division. Four cavalry regiments of two battalions each. The only army cavalry division identified is the Cossack Division, which consists of Don, Kuban, and Terek Cossacks. Some German officers and non-commissioned officers are possibly elements of other nationalities. The Waffen SS is believed to have two cavalry, cavalry divisions. That's interesting, isn't it? What the Americans think they know. Fascinating. Yeah, it really is interesting. It's, it's an amazingly comprehensive book. I mean, I, I do think it's a very good thing to have in one's armory. Yeah. To, to have it. It's just as a reference point. I've used mine a lot over the years. Um, that's certainly the case. But just to go back to this urban warfare thing, I, I just think it's so so interesting. I think you're absolutely right. That is why they're destroying stuff. Because you look at Casino Town, you just think, what's the point of destroying all that? That's just, you know, all you're doing is you're putting rubble in the streets. But actually, their ability to clear the rubble from the streets is pretty impressive because they've got all these caterpillars, you know, they've got all these dozers. Yes. They just go in and just go, and off they go and just clear it out of the way. Exactly. You know, they're used to it. It's it's absolutely part and parcel of what they do. What you're equipped for is is that. Everything you read about this, it's it's clear that fighting in built-up areas is really, really difficult and it's going to burn through your infantry. We keep talking about the man, you know, by, by late 1944, there is a proper manpower crisis. We are running out of people. Yes, and of course, the reason the Sherwood Rangers are complaining about the bombing of Cleve is because they've then got to drive through all these piles of rubble. Yeah. But for the infantry, it's a hell of a lot easier. But do they want to keep having to go around corners in Cleve and be panzerfausted, which is the which is the alternative? No, but it's, it's the lesser of two evils, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. A t- exactly. A town is one great big ambush, is what this manual is basically saying, isn't it? The, the, the opening words of the, of the thing are, is it favours defence? Yeah, but I mean, what is crystal clear in this is the British think by 1943, so it's reprinted with amendments, but I mean, it would be really interesting to get the original one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because this is printed in April 1945, this one. But it's also interesting that even after Casino, even after Cleve, even after Con in April 1945, 
they haven't really changed their view on this. <laughs> no. And I am definitely going to send it to a couple of army mates, but I, I wouldn't have thought there's a lot you could argue with over this. No, go and look at page 29, if you can find it, which is the platoon battle drill for clearing two rows of occupied houses. So we've got two rows of terraced houses. Back to back. Yep. Yep. With a street or back back area B. So that's one platoon to clear sort of a street which has 30 houses in it, roughly, or 30, or, or well, not, not even that many. You look at that, that is incredibly complicated and difficult to organise, isn't it? Yes. And looks time-consuming, if nothing else. If you're an infantry company, that means you can clear two streets with one platoon in reserve. Look how diminished you are immediately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you think how big a bigger city is or a town can be. Or Tona is tiny. It's like 12,000 people. You know, it's not Con. It is not, it's not Arnhem for that matter. No, 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 no. But what what this what's interesting about this diagram as well is that if you if you place that in the context say of the Lombok estate, which is the last estate to the to the northwest, what's opposite the hospital basically, the Saint Elizabeth Hospital, is on this diagram, and, and we'll post a picture of this on this diagram at the top where it says platoon battle drill for clearing two rows of occupied houses. That's where you fall off a cliff because that's where the open space is. So you can. You can get your men through this all you want, but it's going to be really difficult. And then in Arnhem, you find yourself in the open. There's there's that immediate gap. Yeah. With no cover, with a hospital in the middle of it, you're not allowed to fight over. Or you've agreed you're not going to fight over, or you're going to try to not fight over. Yeah. I've read the accounts, and you look at the accounts, you go to the manual, and the manual is telling you what the problem is. The manual is explaining why this is so difficult. Why, in the end, if you haven't done it on the first day, you're never getting through the town, ever. Yes. With what you've brought. So it's a one-hit wonder, basically, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, so, But they're expecting there to not be lots of urban defence, aren't they? That's the point. Well, they're expecting there to be no one around much, but, but I think... No, so you get to the bridge quickly and then you hold it because, because it's much easier to defend a town than it is to attack it. Which is exactly what the manual says is in favour of defence. Well, four battalions, in the end, end up trying to get into the town. And Frost is holding the bridge with a force roughly the equivalent to sort of plumped up battalion with with because he's got brigade headquarters as well and all the all the ancillary soldiers, the RSC and um engineers and all that sort of stuff. And he manages to hold the bridge for, you know, essentially kind of three days. Because in defense it's that it's that much it's it's not easier, but you can you can stymie and thwart the enemy. But that's also proving the point, isn't it? The defense of defense is much easier than. But this doesn't mean that the plan for going to Arnhem was a crazy one, the, it, or, or the the basic concept wasn't a bad idea, because you're not expecting lots of German troops to be in in Arnhem. But the moment they are, you're stuffed. But also, you know, you don't need crack German soldiers to cause delay in a town. No, and they're, they're not crack, are they? By any stretch no, exactly, exactly. So when it loops round, to, it turns out they're Panzer SS. It, do, it doesn't matter who's doing this because, yeah. because as, again, as the manual makes clear, defence is the, is the sort of less difficult thing. Yeah. And especially if you've armoured vehicles. You know, there's a moment in the museum where the St- South Staffords run out of Piat bombs. And that's, that's that. And then there's nothing they can do. Oh, it's absolutely fascinating. I think, you're, I think you're right about, about Con and stuff, though. That's why. Well, it, it strikes me that, you know, you can either do this extremely complicated... And also, everyone knows about Stalingrad. Everyone knows how bad that was and how that hoovered up men and burned through men. And destroyed the German Sixth Army. Exactly. And it's all very well the Soviets having this attitude to, to manpower. We don't have that attitude. So you're, yeah. you're literally... You flatten Con because it's steel, not flesh. And it's more related to the kind of training you've been doing with your infantry all along. That, that's the thing that really leapt out when I read this. Yeah, it's fascinating. Fascinating. I think you're absolutely spot on. Amazing. Wow. Really, really interesting. That's one of the most interesting conversations I've had in a long time. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. <laughs> that's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I love that. No, but it's, it's, it's always great to be made to think about things in a different way, isn't it? It's just brilliant. Well, yeah. And also... Sometimes you read explanations, don't you? They don't explain anything. <laughs> but this is writ very large, isn't it? Yeah. It's still, why did that? But why did that happen? Still, explain why that happened. Yeah. Or, or that doesn't get you over the line with the explanation. You know, that's the the Fibua manual. I, I can't remember where I bought this. Which site it was? It's it's a place that's just tons and tons and tons of manuals, um, which is really good. Well, it's absolutely stupendous. It's really good. Really, really interesting. 
Yeah, well, there we go. Well, we're, we're rolling on with plenty more podcasts. There will be some news soon, but um, I, we can't say any more than this. There will be some news soon about We Have Ways Festival for next year. What we can say is it's going to be good news. It's, it's going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That's what we call expectation management. Very strong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna say I'm doing I'm doing a stint on um, the rest is history this afternoon. Oh, yeah. lucky, lucky fellow that I am, and um, uh, about Savage Storm and well, that was that was good fun, Jim. We got to do the Bengal famine at some point. Yes, we have to cover that. I think we're slightly sort of putting it off, aren't we? Yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, difficult, tricky. Yeah, really, really hard. Although you know, funnily enough, you talked about the Empire program earlier on. I was expecting much more flack on social media than I've had. I was expecting a lot more people calling me like, I mean, maybe there's people I can't see calling me some sort of uh, imperial apologist. And I was also expecting much more people going, you know, why do you hate our country and all that sort of thing. Yeah. And it hasn't really happened, which I'm quite surprised by. I've obviously done, done something well, right. I think you, you tread a very, very delicate but successful line on that is my, my view, takeaway. Thanks. Well, you know, if you can't have a bit of sense of humour about these things, you know. Well, that's it. That's the other thing. And also the fact it's, me with someone from each of those yeah. countries rather than rather than me like guffawing away at the hilarious foreigners, you know. Yeah. No, I think I think it's it's spot on. Hmm. Really enjoyed Good. it. Thanks, Jim. Looking forward to right, episode well, two th- tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everyone for listening. Good luck with the novel, Jim. Um we'll see you all very soon. Cheerio. Cheerio.